uh, my name is Dominique Brossard, professor and chair in LSE, and organizing the colloquium this semester. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Janelle Johnson, who's a professor of rhetorics, politics, and culture in the Department of Communication Art here at UW Madison, and we're very happy also to have her affiliate with LSE. She's the director of the whole Center for Science and Technology Studies, and a focus on the circulation of scientific and medical information in the public sphere, with an emphasis on the social and political dimensions of non-expert engagement with science, medicine, and technology. So hopefully a lot of overlap with people's interest in this room, and please join me in welcoming Janelle. All right, thanks, Dominique, and can people hear this okay? In back, okay, excellent, thanks, Todd. <laughs> awesome, well, this is exciting. I don't think I've given one of these colloquium, I think it was the last time was pre-COVID, so it's yeah, been a few years. 2018, maybe, is it? Yep, I think that was what it was. Um, so, I was, uh, as I was explaining before, this is actually the first time I'm giving a talk based on um, this new book that I have out, and so the talk is, well, thank you very much. I, no one is more excited than that book is out than I am. Uh, it took me a long time to write. Um, and so my presentation today is really going to be to walk you through the book and its arguments and uh, specifically some of the case studies that I look in, in that book. But because I'm lecturing to you all, and this is the Department of Life Sciences Communication, I'm gonna start with a terrible question, okay? So, you know, obviously we're all communication scholars or many of us are communication scholars and we oftentimes debate about what communication is and, you know, folks in the sort of science studies space, we oftentimes debate about what science is and what science is not. But I want to start with this one. This is the Department of Life Sciences Communication. There we go. Terrible question, I said. It's like my very favorite question to ask bio course students. <laughs> All right. What is life? Right in the title of the department, how would you define this phenomenon? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Any folks from the biological sciences in here? This is what you study. Yeah, go for it. And with their environment, okay, interesting. So we've got kind of like an ecological kind of frame for that. I love that. Yeah. Anybody else want to give a stab at this one? What is life? So, I mean, some people would talk about this as, you know, they would talk about quality of living things, right? So they might point to something like reproduction, maybe, or to metabolism, right? And, you know, there's a lot of things that we can start talking about what life is, that life has a carbon base, for example, some of these kinds of things. Um, but one of my very favorite takes on this comes from science popularizer, um, J.B.S. Haldane, who literally writes an essay called What is Life? And then does this dodge, which is, I'm not going to answer this question. And it's not that he doesn't answer the question. Really, he does unpack this in a lot of ways. And he, his definition is that life is essentially a pattern of chemical happenings. But this idea of life itself, as opposed to life that is a quality of living things, for example, he's like, I'm not going to touch that. Um, because it's really difficult to describe. Um, it's some of the, one of those things that's so abstract as to be almost meaningless. So I'm not going to answer that question, and I'm not going to answer it either. Um, so very much on the same token, uh, Michel Foucault, and I should mention, by the way, that I'm not a scientist. I'm not even a social scientist. I'm a humanist, which is why I'm citing someone like Michel Foucault. Um, and so in the order of things, um, where he's you know, unpacking the history um, a lot of the history of the biological sciences, he describes life, he said it doesn't exist. That life per se does not exist. It is an abstraction. And what he means by this is that life is something that is kind of invented in the 19th century with the sort of emergence of the biological sciences. But this idea of life itself, and that's really what I'm concerned with today, this idea of life as a thing. And one of the reasons that people are reluctant to define this is that it starts to push us into a territory of what's called vitalism. So vitalism as this idea of life as kind of a discrete thing, whether it's a substance or maybe a force or maybe an energy. Um, and this is something that has been unpacked and argued about um, and debunked and all kinds of things over the years. So life does not exist 
It's an abstraction. Another take on this comes from uh, the book What is Life uh, by Dorian Sagan and Lynn Margulies. Are people familiar with Lynn Margulies? She's one of the uh, people who invents uh, Gaia theory uh, back in the 70s, very much a famed microbiologist. She writes this book with her son, Dorian Sagan, and the last name should clue you in. His dad is Carl Sagan. Those are two parents to have. It's pretty amazing. But in this book, they describe life as more like a verb than a noun. Um, and so this is taken from an interview that I did with Dorian Sagan, and so this is coming from my book. So he explains that what is life is a linguistic trap. To answer according to the rules of grammar, we must supply a noun, a thing, but life on earth, or life, life on earth is more like a verb. There's only one example we know of, life as a contiguous phenomenon, and that's the example of which we are a part. So this example is not fully circumscribed by describing it as a vitalistic substance, but is better viewed as an ongoing process, one that is evolving. To call it a thing would be to short shrift it. So the focus of the book that came out last year is not about what is life. Yeah, I know, I love it. <laughs> By the way, the, the, the description of this, if you ever write a book, you don't usually get a lot of input into the cover, but the description I gave to the marketing team was, think David Attenborough, but like at the end of his career when he starts talking about climate change and extinction, and I think they did a pretty good job. <laughs> so, what this book does is to walk through a lot of examples where life itself comes to be the subject of moral consideration and political action. And so I'm not interested in what life is really, but about what happens when people argue on behalf of life. And in fact, that was the original name of this book, was On Behalf of Life. People who are out there and taking um, actions of what I call vital advocacy. And so, um, the structure of the book is that, you know, four chapters, introduction and conclusion, and then you will see that interspersed between the chapters, I have interviews with a number of people. So one of them, Dorian Sagan, one of them, Kyle White, um, who is a professor at the University of Michigan, and one of them is Catherine Conley, who's an astrobiologist who works at NASA, or used to work at NASA. So what I'm going to do today is I'm basically going to walk you through the book and give you some examples of what it is that I'm talking about, um, about this thing that we call life. So when I was starting this book, one of the things that I was kind of obsessed with uh, was a phenomenon that historian Frank White calls the overview effect. And the overview effect is a name that he gives to a very common experience that astronauts have when leaving Earth's atmosphere and looking back down on the planet. Um, and they speak very movingly about what it's like to see that planet. Um, and so this is a phenomenon that almost everybody has. Um, if you followed William Shatner going up into space, one of my favorite parts of that is he came back really depressed that he had seen the Earth and he had seen, you know, the kind of fragile thing that it was and he came back really, really sad about it. But so one of the, my favorite examples of the overview effect comes from this guy, um, Rusty Schweikert, who was part of the Apollo Astronaut Corps. And so he was part of the Apollo 9 mission, which tested the lunar module. This, an, this is a photograph that he took of um, another astronaut, Dave Scott, um, when he's looking down on the planet. And as Rusty Schweikert was looking down on the planet and experiencing the overview effect, um, he was tremendously moved by it and was invited, once he got back in the 70s, to come and give a talk to this really interesting organization of people called the Lindisfarne Society, which was a group of people who were interested in what they called planetary culture. And so they wanted Schweikert to come and talk about what it was like to be out in space. Um, and so he gives this incredible speech um, where he really waxes poetically about what it's like to look down on the earth from above. And as he's talking, one of the things that he did I, I found really, really interesting is he kept using the word identity. That he said when he went into space that his very sense of who he was shifted. That he no longer just identified with himself, he said he looked down and you realized that your identity is with that whole thing. That he saw himself not as a representative of NASA or the United States, but he called himself a representative of this thing we called life. And so that, that is where I take that term um, for the introduction. But the other thing I take from Schweikert um, is the concept that really anchors this book, which is a concept that I call bioidentification. 
And so I'm a rhetorician, which means that I study language and symbols and argument, how people persuade other people. Um, and one of our key figures, one of our sort of like canonical saints is this guy, Kenneth Burke. Um, and this is his most well-known book, A Rhetoric of Motives. And within that book, there is a central theory that he calls identification, which is how you persuade someone by emphasizing a shared commonality. And he writes there, it's really hard to read it off that screen, so I'm just going to do it here. He says, A is not identical with his colleague B, but insofar as their interests are joined, A is identified with B, or he may identify himself with B even when their interests are not joined if he assumes they are or is persuaded to believe so. Here are the ambiguities of substance. In being identified with B, A is substantially one with a person other than himself, yet at the same time he remains unique, an individual locus of motives. Thus he is both joined and separate at once, a distinct substance and consubstantial with another. And so I want to pull out a couple of things here. So what I call bioidentification isn't really anything new. It's just an example of this identification where life is invoked, is something that we share, um, with other people, but what I'm principally concerned with is with non-human entities, how life is used as this common substance. And so the case studies, what I'm looking at in this book are a number of examples of what I call vital advocacy, which are movements on behalf of life itself. So obviously there are a lot of movements that have taken life as a central point of organizing. You can think about something, for example, like Black Lives Matter. But that's not about life itself, it's about human life. It's about black life. It's not about how we might think about life as a whole, right? And so vital advocacy is really when you start to see life, that thing that might not exist, that thing that is very difficult to define, become the centerpiece of uh, ethical discussions and political actions. So in the first chapter of the book, um, what I do is to unpack some of the limits of this idea. And so, you know, one of the things, um, you know, as we create theory, as we create concepts, is to think about them as kind of universal, right, as generalizable. Um, but what I do in the first chapter is really to show how this idea, both identification but also life, thinking about this um, as, as a concept, is really something that emerges in the West. And so thinking about, for example, something like biological individuality, which is something that's been really you know, key in histories of the biological sciences, um, that these are things that have this kind of uniquely Western tint to them. And so what I do in this first chapter is really to try to unpack the limits of this idea, where it fits and where it doesn't fit. And what I do with this is to look at a case study um, of the Dakota Access Pipeline actions that happened in 2016 and 2017. And are people familiar with these? Yeah. So if you're familiar with these, um, and this is something that happened um, with the Standing Rock Sioux um, in response to uh, the proposed building of a pipeline across um, the Missouri River, um, one of the things that really came to the fore with these actions was the Lakota phrase, mini Wichoni, um, which roughly translated means water is life. And this is something that has kind of started circulate, circulating beyond that example and into broader kind of environmental discourse, this idea of water's life. And you see this in a lot of the signage here. And so I really initially, when I started working on this book, I was thinking that this would be a case study of what I was talking about, a kind of interesting one where life is being appended to you know, what uh, people in you know, Western science might not think of as living. Um, and doing that kind of bioidentification work. But the more I looked at it, and the more I looked at, for example, Lakota cosmology, where that phrase comes from, the more I realized that what I'm talking about and what they're talking about are very different. And I think that difference was really important to unpack. And so when thinking about what that means, oh, I lost it. Oh, there we go, that's where the phrase is, sorry. This is so hard <laughs> to do. I'm used yeah, to, to lecturing and looking up here. Um, I'm just gonna stay here. <laughs> so uh, from indigenous studies scholar, uh, Brian Burkhart, who's a philosopher, um, who had examined this, this phrase, mini Wachoni, and what it does. The way that he explains this phrase, he says that water is indeed life and in more than a material sense. Mini is the lifeblood of the earth and the sky, which is why the word mini, water, has the word ni or life already within it. So even within that language, mini water is life within the word mini itself. And I love that. So in thinking about this, um, you know, we think about what it means to call something living. 
And one of the examples um, that uh, comes out of the conversation that I had with Kyle Poes White is this idea of how life can be used to kind of make connections between humans and non-human entities. And what he says in our interview, he says, when indigenous people but also other groups talk about a politics of life or an ethics of life, they're using a few words to express what for them is a bigger reality. Kinship makes it possible to understand all of your relationships, all of the different relatives as living, whether in a Western scientific sense they're deemed as living or not. Kinship opens up a way of relating to anything that makes it living in a way. So what White is talking about here and what comes to really matter in the book is thinking about one of the things that life does is that it gives a kind of moral considerability to it, to an entity, right? Is to think about, um, you know, whether we think about something as living, um, because it can be killed, it is fragile, it is vulnerable, and is worth protecting. And so you start to see that ethical consider moral considerability start to kind of creep in here. So in the second chapter, um, I look at a, a, a group of folks called deep ecologists. Um, again, how many have heard of something called deep ecology? Okay, taught, taught you sort of deep ecology. Um, so deep ecology is a really difficult thing to describe. Um, some people have described this as a philosophy. Some people have described it as a kind of religious or spiritual approach um, to the non-human world. Um, and other people will describe it as a political movement. And so it really kind of takes a lot of these things. Um, and I, what I like to think about it, because I'm a rhetorician, is that I think of deep ecology as a rhetoric. Um, because what it is, is a way of arguing for the value of the non-human world. So when I was looking at deep ecology, one of the things that, that led me to use this as one of the chief case studies is because identification, that concept of identification, bioidentification specifically, um, they don't use that word, but that's what they're talking about, comes to be really central in what they're doing. And so this is um, a quote that is from uh, the work of a Norwegian philosopher named Arne Nass. Um, Ness was one of the people who founded this field. He's very much thought of um, as kind of the, the father of deep ecology. And he describes the way that he started thinking this way, this, this way of thinking, actually came from when he was doing an experiment. And he writes, I was looking through an old-fashioned microscope at the dramatic meeting of two drops of different chemicals. At that moment, a flea jumped from a lemming that was strolling along the table. The insect landed in the middle of the acid chemicals. To save it was impossible. It took minutes for the flea to die. The tiny being's movements were dreadfully expressive. Naturally, I felt a painful sense of compassion and empathy. But the empathy was not basic. Rather, it was a process of identification. I saw myself in the flea. If I had been alienated from the flea, not seeing intuitively anything even resembling myself, the death struggle would have left me feeling indifferent. So there must be identification for there to be compassion and, among humans, solidarity. And so what Ness does and what um, the group of deep ecologists were to do with this idea uh, was to use this really this connection um, of which life was the principal means of relating as a way of arguing for environmental protection. And so deep ecology emerges in the 1970s with the broader environmental movement and it's one of the influences on a group called Earth First, which is a radical environmental group um, primarily based in the West. And the connections between deep ecology and Earth First are so deep, in fact, that um, deep ecology, the principles of deep ecology, were actually first published in the Earth First newsletter. And so the founders, um, Dave Foreman particularly, of Earth First were really inspired. Many people who were involved in this movement then and still now see themselves as part of this deep ecology um, philosophy. So this way of thinking about the environment, thinking about um, non-human entities as worthy of care and protection, one of the things that starts to happen um, in environmental organizing through the 1970s, and particularly in the 1980s, is that you start to see within certain quarters of the movement, and Earth First was one of these places, is what I would describe as a distinctly anti-human sentiment. And so there was this idea that the Earth needed to be saved, the environment needed to save, non-human entities needed to save, and the reason they needed saving is because we, humans, were the ones 
that were doing the damage. And so humanity, in a lot of this rhetoric, takes the position of a villain, right? Humanity is the problem, and so to deal with this, sometimes humanity needs to be dealt with themselves. And so this, this strain of, of what is often called anti-humanism um, develops into what is now often called, but then to um, eco-fascism, um, which is, and I could unpack this for a long time, um, but is very much this idea that kind of by any means necessary, the natural world ought to be saved. And so here's a, a representative quote from um, a guy, Peter Reed, um, who writes, for the sake of the austere mystery of nature as thou, we have to ask ourselves whether the preservation of humanity is of overriding importance and suggests maybe if we truly want to save the planet, that maybe it's us that need to go. Um, and he makes this argument really explicitly. And so in the 1980s, you know, this, is, this position, this anti-humanist position, was one that caused a lot of controversy within environmental organizations. And so a really well-known green organizer, um, an anarchist, Murray Bookchin, took this straight on, and he calls this ecofascism. He says, ecofascism is a real possibility within our movement today. It made direct connections with the fact that most of his rel relatives had been murdered in the Holocaust. Um, and said, you know, a lot of the things that he was seeing in this anti-humanist rhetoric had disturbing echoes of some of the rhetoric that was happening in Nazi Germany. And so another example of what this looks like, so this quote here, Human, humankind alone is no longer the focus of thought, but rather life as a whole. So again, life itself. This striving toward connectedness with the totality of life, with nature itself, a nature into which we are born, this sounds great, right? It's like, I'm on board. This is the deepest meaning and the true essence of national socialist thought. And so this idea of thinking about life, um, and other people have done this work historically, unpacking the role of things like vitalism, for example, in Nazi ideology. Um, but there's some real dangers in some of this. So anti-humanism, this idea that humans are not part of the living world and we are to be blamed, that, that something is bad with this, um, is something that pops up in a lot of different ways. And the case study that I focus on at the end of this chapter about deep ecology is this book, which is called Can Life Prevail? by a Finnish ecologist named Penti Linkola. And so this book is really a collection of essays about the environment. Um, you know, he talks a lot about um, forests and preserving um, different kinds of things. He talks a lot about birds. Um, he cares a lot about birds in this. Um, but the reason that I look at this in this chapter is for two reasons. One of them is that this book is marketed and described as a work of deep ecology. This is how Linkola is described, how he thought about himself. And the other part is that this book was published by something called Arctos Media, which is a white supremacist press. So those connections absolutely come together in a work like Penti Linkola. And so this, I'll just give you a couple representative examples here. So you see this anti-humanist rhetoric here. Everywhere man remains a complete loud, a destroyer of the biosphere. The worst enemy of life is too much life, the excess of human life. The protection of life is justified at whatever cost. And making this abundantly clear, he says, what to do when a ship carrying 100 passengers has suddenly capsized and only one lifeboat is available for 10 people in the water? When the lifeboat is full, those who hate life will try to pull more people onto it, thus drowning everyone. Those who love and respect life will instead grab an ax and sever the hands clinging to the gunwales. Now, I'm not being you know, hyperbolic when I describe this. Yeah, no, this is, it, it goes into darker places because one of the other things that Linkola argues here and what he describes in this book is he describes um, the work of Nazi Germany and the work of Stalin. He describes these as depopulation campaigns and speaks of them in approving terms. This is why this is published by a white supremacist press. And so, you know, when we think about, well, what does it mean to do this vital advocacy? You know, it sounds really comforting and kind of cuddly, but it really leads to some really dark places. And this, this idea, you know, of what's called ecofascism is something that also had a kind of a resurgence in the early days of COVID. I don't know if you saw some of this. This idea that Earth is recovering 
when people are in lockdowns. This is from a representative tweet that got a lot of attention. Air pollution is slowing down. Water pollution is clearing up. Natural wildlife returning home. Coronavirus is Earth's vaccine. We're the virus. Um, and in response to this from the Lakota Law Projects, humans are not the virus. Indigenous people have shown that it is possible to live in balance with nature, colonialism and extraction for profit. Those are the virus. So in a lot of ways, what this chapter does is to investigate how we understand humans as living things in relation to the wider world. How do we understand how those two things go together? You know, when we're talking about something like identification, you saw this in the quote from Burke, we're talking about both similarity and difference and kind of trying to hold those things together. And so the next chapter really continues the conversation from the DP Ecology chapter and this is the um, essay that I had distributed. So um, the next chapter is based on an essay that I wrote. Um, that is, I don't remember the name of the essay, which is terrible. Um, but in the book, it's called Death Itself. Um, and it's uh, looking at two movements that take human extinction as really the kind of centerpiece of, of their organizing. And so what I do here is to do kind of a contrasting case study of this group, which is vehement, um, which is a great acronym that stands for the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement, and Extinction Rebellion. Um, have people heard of these? Okay, so Extinction Rebellion got a lot of press. Um, this is a relatively new organization that emerged. Um, they really are identified with a lot of climate work, um, and that's when people think about a lot of their stuff, that's what they're doing. But the term extinction in their description uh, actually suggests what, what it is that they're doing. They're not just organizing on behalf of climate, but also against the mass extinction crisis. And they really try to put those two things in tension with each other. But one of the things that I found really fascinating about this is that the prospect of human extinction takes shape in very different ways in each of these movements. So vehement, which is something that emerged in the 1990s, um, it was kind of, I remember seeing this back in the 1990s because they used to put out a fanzine and I would see this in like music stores, the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement, but they're still around. They've got groups, I think, on Facebook and they're, you know, they've got digital presence. But a lot of what uh, the, the uh, Voluntary Human Extinction Movement is about, is really about population reduction. And so that's really kind of where they focus it. And so you see, you know, some of their bumper stickers, thank you for not breathing, may we live long and die out, thank you for thinking before breeding. They're kind of funny, I will say. A lot of what they are using is human, you know, or humor to, to, to argue against, you know, humanity. Um, but they describe themselves. So what is vehement? Who is vehement might be more accurate, they write. Vehement is people, caring people who believe that life on Earth should be preserved. Ethical people who have accepted the evidence, judged the situation, and made the logical decision to live long and die out. Optimistic people who foresee a future world where nature is allowed to live freely and abundantly. Now, what I argue in the book is that what draws these things together, and I will say that vehement very much didn't see themselves as, as an eco-fascist movement, and they actually talk a little bit about this in some of their material, but the lines of argument that they have very much draw them in line with some of those earlier examples I was using. And what I argue draws them in line with folks like Pentilinkula is an anti-humanist form of species thinking. Um, thinking about humans, you know, in total as a species that situates human life in an inverse relationship to the rest of life on Earth. Simply put, when vehement and other groups like them speak of life itself, humans are not imagined to be part of it except as an all-powerful agent on a passive living world, a reproduction of the institutionalized, long-dominant Euro-Western fantasy that all that is fully human is fallen from Eden, separated from the mother, in the domain of the artificial, deracinated, alienated, and therefore free. And that last quote comes from Donna Haraway. So in contrast to vehement, the second case study of this chapter is on Extinction Rebellion. And here we see a lot of that bioidentification, a lot of that vital advocacy, and life comes up in a lot of different messaging here. And so you see one of their very common slogan here is to rebel for life, so rebel for life. Um, we are life, and so life really takes center stage here. Now, unlike vehement, um, Extinction Rebellion sees human, human extinction as a bad thing. And so they are not, um, you know, using this as an argument that for the good of the earth, humans should die out. But what they do use is human extinction, the prospect of human extinction, to really wake people up um, to what is at stake in the mass extinction crisis. 
Um, and this is a quote from Gail Bradbook, uh, who's uh, one of the founders. And she says, we think it's important to talk about the possibility of human extinction in order to expand the window of acceptable discourse on climate change and ecological collapse. But we also acknowledge that this is not only about our species and that the web of life is intricately interconnected. So the final case study of the book is um, my favorite. <laughs> And um, this is a weird chapter, I'm gonna be honest. Um, it took me forever to write this. Um, and so this chapter is, you know, I, as I started with Rusty Schweikert, the book starts in space and it ends there. Um, and this chapter looks at uh, interplanetary contamination. So this phenomenon in a couple of different ways. Um, it looks at the formation of the field of astrobiology and it ends by considering how some of these ways of thinking about life um, as it might happen off planet and what that might mean for, for example, about going to explore Mars. And Mars really kind of ends up taking central stage in the chapter. And the reason that this is uh, my very favorite chapter is because this is where the book came from. So a lot of these questions that I've had about, about life and what it is and how difficult it is to define came from, I believe it was uh, around 20, two, 2006. Somehow I saved this, this note, which was great. Um, these are notes I took while watching a documentary about astrobiology, um, and I was really confounded by a, kind of a, just an interesting question when you think about it. So astrobiology, which is the study of the origins and distribution of life in the universe, one of the things that, that animates this, um, and I was just part of a, a working group for NASA where we talked a lot about astrobiology and what they do. And definition of life is absolutely key to what it is. If you're gonna look for life elsewhere, having a sense of what life is is really central, right? How are you gonna know what life looks like somewhere else if you don't have a sense of what it is? But this is obviously something that's really difficult because what we know life is comes from one example and that's this planet. And so that tension between how we understand life itself as this kind of general phenomenon versus life on Earth, which is very specific to this place, um, is a really interesting scientific question. And so the, the, the birth of astrobiology, it was then called exobiology, sometimes people will still call it that, um, really associated with this guy, Joshua Lederberg, um, who was faculty here for a very short time. He's also Nobel laureate. Um, but he was very, very interested in this field. And one of the reasons that he was so interested in this field wasn't just about protecting life elsewhere, but he saw it as a tremendously scientifically valuable thing. So he writes, in the past, biology's domain has been limited to the thin shell of life on the Earth, to the way in which one spark of life has illuminated one speck in the cosmos. By contrast, the basic laws of physics are derived from the motions of the stars, and we know the scope of chemistry from the studies of the light emitted by stars at the boundaries of the observable universe. As yet, biology has no such grand universal system. The ultimate goal of the exobiologist then is to answer questions about all life. And what Lederberg saw as, as the real true value of exobiology is that it had the potential to make biology a similar kind of science to something like physics and chemistry. Um, he saw the power of really kind of that universalizing function if we were to have another instance of life in the universe. So, you know, this is a little bit about the history of astrobiology, but where I really focus in on this chapter is on a phenomenon of what is called interplanetary contamination. So a concern for um, the contamination of other celestial bodies is something that is oftentimes forgotten. It's, it seems like kind of a, a side note but it was central to the development of policies guiding space exploration. And so this is a portion from the Outer Space Treaty um, from 1967, of which all spacefaring um, countries were uh, signed. And it says, parties to the treaty shall pursue studies of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, and conduct exploration of them so as to avoid their harmful contamination and also adverse changes in the environment of the Earth resulting from the introduction of extraterrestrial matter. And where necessary, shall adopt appropriate measures for this purpose. And so you see within the Outer Space Treaty two kinds of contamination that come to the fore. So one of them is known as forward contamination, which is contaminating other celestial bodies, and the other one is known as back or backward contamination, which is contamination of the Earth with uh, material from elsewhere. 
And so one of the places um, in recent years this has come to back to the fore um, are in some debates that have happened over whether or not, for example, um, if it's possible at some point to bring samples from Mars back to the Earth, if that's a good idea. There's actually a whole group of people who's organized against this, thinking that this could be catastrophic to life on Earth, um, to basically bring something if there's potentially a pathogen there. And there's all kinds of reasons why that's very, very, very unlikely. Um, but it's something that people have a lot of concern about. So one of the things, for example, that I took a look at, not for the book, just um, because I was interested, is uh, NASA held a, a town hall and had a period of public comment about Mars sample return. And overwhelmingly, the comments that they received, at least in the, in the written comments, were very negative. People were very, very concerned about the potential of, of extraterrestrial life as a biohazard. Now, one of the places historically where you'll see this um, the image on this slide is an image of the Apollo 11 astronauts. And when the Apollo 11 astronauts came back from the first trip to the moon, for three weeks, they were put in quarantine. And so this is an image of them meeting with Richard Nixon. You can see them in their like modified Airstream trailer. Um, and this came directly from concerns that people had that they were gonna bring moon germs back from the germ, from, from, from the moon that were gonna contaminate the earth. Now, one of the things that I absolutely loved about this is that this was a big, big concern for the public, for scientists, um, and I thought a lot about, for example, some of the stuff around nanotechnology about this. Scientists thought this was ridiculous, that this was basically like safety theater that was being put into place for the American public. Um, Joshua Lederberg, for example, was part of these, these conversations, and he's like, well, this is ridiculous, but it serves as kind of this public relations measure that we're doing. Um, there was this chemist named Edwin Anders, and I loved it. He, he basically said he was willing to swallow a sample of moon rocks to prove the point that they were, they were absolutely safe. So, you know, what are we going to do? <laughs> now, one of the reasons that people were so scared of moon germs, and this is why humanities is important, um, there was something that happened the summer of 1969. Well, there are a lot of things that happened the summer of 1969. But one of them, fortuitous for the author, is the publication of this book by Michael Crichton. Someday I will write a book where I don't have to <laughs> deal with Michael Crichton, but that day is not today. This book came out that summer. It was a book at the Month Club. Everybody read it. And if you're familiar with this story, it has to do with an extraterrestrial pathogen that comes and is basically let loose with people were fear that it was going to cause this plague. I mean, it was this, this super danger. Um, it's terrible, but, you know, whatever. So people were really scared. They wrote to NASA. Um, they flooded NASA with letters, worried about moon germs. And thus, um, we've got the astronauts in the Airstream trailer. So concerns about interplanetary contamination are not just historical, though. Um, one of the people that I interviewed for the book is this woman, um, Catherine Conley. And she has, or she had for 12 years, I think, what is the coolest title job title I've ever heard of, which is the Director of Planetary Protection. That was her job. And what that meant is that she was the person who was in charge of um, following the Outer Space Treaty, and specifically she uh, was the person who guided, for example, the sterilization of Mars rovers. So that was, you know, all the stuff that's on Mars would come through. She would have to basically make sure that they were baking this stuff to the right degree. And the reason for that was to avoid bringing Earth microbes to Mars. And so, you know, there's a couple of different ways in which we can think about forward contamination as a problem. So one of them is just basically a scientific problem. Um, and, you know, the way that Cassie likes to describe this is, like, it would be really dumb to announce that we had discovered life on Mars only to discover that we really just discovered ourselves, right? So we brought, the, you know, that life. And so really it had to do with kind of keeping Mars as a kind of clean room where we could do, you know, experiments like they did in the 70s um, with the Viking mission to, to look for um, evidence of life on Mars. Um, and in our interview, she describes it, and I asked her directly, you know, what would it mean if we found life, you know, elsewhere? And she said, it's an interesting thing, but it isn't paradigm breaking in any way. It's just, okay, that gives us an N of two for understanding how life started. I mean, this whole idea of panspermia, which is a theory um, that life was seeded on Earth and kind of distributed through the, university, uh, through the universe. This whole idea of panspermia, that's one of the interesting questions of astrobiology. Is life on Mars related to life on Earth? And this is why planetary protection is so important. If we have contamination from Earth and we want to see life on Mars and we don't even know if the life on Mars is related to us or not, these are important reasons for why contamination control is important. 
But the people in charge of doing this have already made up their minds that it's not important. And one of the things that she said in our interview is that this focus on interplanetary contamination has really started to recede um, from some of the directives um, that are happening at, at NASA and JPL. So what would it mean to find extraterrestrial, what would it mean to find life on Mars? So one of the reasons that forward contamination is a concern is because it would impact our scientific practice, right? Another reason it might be a concern is maybe there's something about that life that deserves to be protected. And so maybe it's the case that those microbes, if they exist, might deserve to have a life of their own. And one of the most famous lines about this comes from Carl Sagan. And he argues in Cosmos that if there is life on Mars, we should do nothing with Mars. Mars then belongs to the Martians, even if the Martians are only microbes. Um, and this is an idea that people have critiqued up and down. Um, there's a lot of people, uh, I'm trying to think of what, what the guy's name is. I lost it, anyway. Um, but this, this idea that, for example, if we find life on Mars, that we should leave it alone. We should never go back there. And the idea is that we should preserve that indigenous biotic life as it is and stay away because we don't have a really great track record um, in going to new spaces um, and respecting the life there. So this is one way of thinking about the value of life on Mars, that, that you know, Mars is something that belongs even to microbial Martians. Another perspective on this, this is astrobiologist David Grinspoon, who's one of the organizers of the workshop that I was just at. He makes the argument that, um, you know, thinking about that sense of territoriality and belonging, he argues Mars does not belong to America, nor to Earth, nor to human beings, but if, we, but if by we, we mean life, then yes, Mars belongs to us because this universe belongs to life. And I love that line. But thinking about this idea of you know, Grinspoon and there are other people who have argued that it is our ethical duty to bring life where it might not be. So even if there is no life on Mars, you know, is, is our responsibility to spread life throughout the universe as this kind of, you know, progenitor of life? Um, people have made that argument. So, you know, this, this chapter, you know, the, the thing that it really turns on is this question of ethics. How do we understand ethics that kind of grow out from this broader environmental ethics? Um, and one of the, the folks who writes about this um, could not have done a better job of defining what I call bioidentification. They argue that we believe that this common anchor point, an anchor point for an ethics, an extraterrestrial ethics, is actually very simple and straightforward. It is simply life. Despite multiple differences in cultural, religion, and custom, living is one reality that all persons share in common with one another, as well as with non-human animals, plants, and microbes here on Earth. If we discover extraterrestrial organisms, whether it is a humble microbe on Mars or a vastly superior space traveler from another planet, we will share life in common. And so they propose here a kind of biocentric ethics guiding responsible space exploration. So I'm gonna just kind of wrap this up here. The, the book ends with a meditation, as I think all books published in the last couple of years do on COVID. Um, and so one of the things that I'm drawn to is the idea that in a lot of different languages, the word for life and the word for breath are the same. Um, in Latin, dianima means life, breath, and also soul. Um, and use this as a kind of meditation about what it means to think about what it means to be living bodies um, in community with each other and kind of ends with a, a, a reading of the pandemic in that particular way. So I'm going to wrap things up there and I'm happy to take your questions.